come on. We need humor today, Tom. Come back. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm here. But we want to see you. <laughs> that, that. That, that was a whole tease right there. I thought we had a guest speaker coming in. And Tom it's was cute. Like, oh. It's cute. It made us all smile. <laughs> I want to smile. Well, you have a chipped tooth, so I would say maybe you don't want to. <clears throat> Can't really see it. I see it. Oh, my goodness. Do, 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 do. What a lovely, lovely Monday. Or at least I hope everyone had a lovely Monday. Or is having a lovely Monday. I mean, I'm starting to get a lot of questions um, about the pins and how that's going to happen. Is it going to be the ballot point? People are like starting to freak out. Am I going to get it? I don't really know what to say. I mean, I'm just saying it. it's probably the same as the last time. Um, yes, and they'll have a, a longer time of opportunity in order to, if they don't have their pin after voting opens, to be able to get that capture. As long as they're um, registered, yeah. Yeah, um, so, so as long as they're eligible to vote, the actual cutoff time as it relates to registration actually ends a few days after um, voting opens, and that is a right. change from last year. So right, you, you might want to you might want to speak to that, Taisha, because I know I know it does, but maybe coming from you, it'll be clearer. The eighth, oh. right? That's the deadline. Yes, yeah, so. I'm gonna say yes. I'm saying yes until Tom, like you know, maybe turns off his video and corrects me on that. No, I think you're right. I'm eighth. pretty sure. <laughs> you can always always ask our guru, Michael Arthur, knows all. That is also accurate. All right, it is 7.05. Um, I'm going to open this meeting. This is town hall number six, 11.29, 7 p.m. Eastern Standard. And we are going to um, thank the negotiating team and TWU for all their labor and hard work and creating and providing space for us to gain clarity and understanding as it relates to our TA2 town hall. Um, at this time as housekeeping, just now created a housekeeping note for those who, um, and this is to memorialize this statement for the town hall for those who are listening later on, but please note that when voting opens and you uh, do not receive a registration number or realize that you have not registered to vote, there is opportunities up until um, the 8th of December for you to actually capture that miss. Um, and gain the, uh, a registration number and a register to vote, that is a change from last year. So even after voting opens, there is an opportunity for in-flight crew members who are eligible to vote, which means those who are graduating, uh, who have graduated 11, 31, 21 or sooner um, to be able to gain that registration uh, pin and be able to vote from uh, December 6th to December 13th. So that is my housekeeping note for today. We are now going to turn to our article unpacking and we're gonna start with article five, that is page 16 in your TA2 hymnals. And that article unpacking is gonna begin with Stacy. Stacy is our JFK uh, negotiating team member and I'm gonna pass it to her. Good evening, Stacy. Hi everyone. Uh, I hope we're all sufficiently recovered from the uh, feasting and festivities of last week. Um, to begin with um, occupational seniority, the very beginning is that uh, it is the sole basis for bidding and awards for your monthly bid lines, reserve, r, &R. it's going to be how furlough and recall is decided, base transfers, and your vacation, uh, as well as charter and other flying, but it doesn't exclude uh, Mint, LOD, VIP, and qualified roles for the purposes of um, who goes into those programs. The company still maintains uh, ownership, for lack of a better term, over 
who they choose. But once you are in that program, again, your bidding and, uh, and everything else goes by your company, uh, your, sorry, your occupational seniority, your company is your uh, higher date with the company overall, your occupational seniority is the day that you began as in flight. Um, paragraph B just talks about um, how your seniority is assigned to you from uh, your initial training class. Uh, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, when you get into paragraph C, uh, we have that the company will provide an updated seniority list at least quarterly. Um, and we have the right to contest that. Um, then paragraph T just talks about um, how you lose your seniority. Uh, you resign, uh, you leave the company, retire, transfer out of the bargaining unit. And when we talk about transferring out of the bargaining unit, we are talking about <clears throat> management, supervisors, um, support roles, so when you ha when you talk about um, support roles, that's you know the people that are working in the office. It says crew on their badge. They don't fly, um, or they're um, working at the Orlando Support Center and training. Um, and supervisors are you know our team leads, and management is anyone above the level of team lead. So for the purposes of determining. Uh, who loses, retains seniority. Um, we have pre-ratification and post-ratification. So you, you were already in management prior to um, ratification of this contract. Um, then you will, and we have a list of who is in management, supervisor and support roles. So that's not, um, that's not going to be contested. We have that list. If you were already in management, you will keep your seniority for five years. Uh, and at the end of that time. And she popped out. So I'm going to give her a like five seconds to jump back in, but it probably means that we may have to skip her and circle back. Um, so just in case she has to pop out, I'm going to move on actually to article 15. So Sonia would have been like, oh, she's coming back. What? Your video is popping out, by the way. I'm just letting you know. But you can, you can hear me? I can hear you now. You couldn't hear me before? Nope. Okay. Let me do the. Let me do the thing. Or is it okay now? Yeah, yeah. So we lost you right when you were talking about the uh, the team leads. So anyone over anyone um, greater oh, than a well. team lead, okay, and then you froze. Yeah. yeah. All right. So I'm going to get through this, and and then I'm going to restart um, the way I did last time, and that fixed it. Um, so if you are a team uh, above the level of a team lead, that's management. And uh, if you are in management already, you are going to um, freeze at the level you're at at the date of ratification. And then from there on, you will be frozen there. You will not accrue any new seniority. And at the five-year mark, you will, you will lose your seniority. Um, and then if you are um, a supervisor, team lead, um, anyone in a support role, you will uh, accrue up to five years, and then you will um, you will freeze at that point, and that's where you retain your seniority. And time served in management, supervisory roles, or support roles are cumulative, and that catches the job hoppers. Um, post ratification, anyone going into management after the date of ratification will retain only for twelve months, and then if they have not uh, made a decision to come back to in flight, they forfeit all seniority. And if you go into a supervisor or support role at that time, uh, you have to have had one year as in flight to accrue any seniority. And at that time, you will accrue up to five years and you'll retain from there. Um, and you might think we were a little bit lenient with the supervisors and the uh, support role types, but it's because we want good people who know what it is to be a flight attendant in those jobs. Um, it's better for us if those people know what it is to be a flight attendant. If we make it too appealing, we chase them away and we get people who don't care about being a flight attendant, which is uh, not really what we want. 
So from there, um, we talk about um, the different types of in-flight seniority. So the um, regular line IFCs, and then we have the 9,000 series. Um, and those are, you know, the people who do the, um, the speaking positions, but they're not qualified. Um, and, and that those, they are not part of our bargaining unit and they do not um, have a seniority that impacts us. And uh, if you go to the letter of agreement, number three, that is where you'll find our list uh, or the provision that we have a list of everyone who is in management supervisory or support roles. So uh, those cannot be contested. And that pretty much covers uh, occupational seniority. And I'm gonna cut out and fix my nonsense here. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stacy. Stacy just finished unpacking occupational seniority. That's article five, um, starting at page 16. Um, and I provided the Canvas supplemental reading link for that specific unpacking. Our next article is going to be um, unpacked by Sonia. This is going to be Article 15 training. This is going to be page beginning on page 77, and I'm going to hand it to Sonia. Sonia is our Boston negotiating team member. Welcome, Sonia. Thank you, Taisha. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us for our sixth sixth town hall. I'm going to talk about training, article number 15. So this is going to be a, a, it's quite a short article, and it mostly deals with um, the different types of training that we uh, participate in. So it's going to cover um, recurrent down in Orlando, uh, QDL, any sort of other training, and then the how do you bid for it and things like that. Um, most of it is our current company policy. However, we did get some great wins in the article. So I'm going to go over those a little bit um, since we want to highlight those, of course. So the firstly, uh, first great win we have is that if the company cancels recurrent, so say for instance, there is a weather hurricane or something in the Orlando uh, training facility and recurrent is canceled, uh, you will be pay protected for the training. Currently, if you, that happens and they cancel recurrent, you are put on RSL. So this is a great win for us. If recurrent is canceled, you'll be pay protected for your trip. You'll also be pay protected for any trip that needs to be removed from your line so that you can attend recurrent within that same month. So again, another very, uh, big win here for us as well. If you attend recurrent after it's canceled on days off, you'll get JRA pay. So again, this is great. If recurrent is canceled, you are no longer put on RSL, you're pay protected for the trip. Uh, another big win, which has been um, a big issue for our IFCs over the past year is that if you um, complete training, the company has 72 hours to update your training records. So this is for your QDLs, recurrent, requalification, whatever the training is, they must update it within 72 hours. If they don't, and you do have trips on your line, you'll be pay protected for those trips that you're removed from and you will not receive a UNA, which is current company policy. So again, this is uh, something that is completely grievable. The company would have to show the burden of proof as to uh, the time frame of why they did not update the records and uh, you know, uh, something that is a, is a huge, huge win for the IFCs here. Um, it's still happening this past week. So uh, a, a big issue that we were happy to get uh, codified here in our contract. Um, another big win is any non-recurrent training. So a training such as the promises or the passport to sex, uh, success, excuse me, passport to success, one of the classroom-based trainings that usually took place in your own base um, will not be scheduled for more than nine hours per day. So it can't be these very you know, multi-day trainings that uh, go on and on that could have been condensed. There's a nice time frame around those. Um, so in our compensation article number 23, is where we have the information for the training pay. And I just wanna to touch on that, even though it's not necessarily in the training article number 15, it's the training pay and there was a big win there as well. So I just kind of wanna bridge those two together. So in our compensation article, we um, there's a slight change in the training pay. So the IFCs will be paid five block hours for the, uh, the CQT, the recurrent required footprint. So that's the normal two day block that we, that we attend recurrent. If the CQT footprint is expanded by one or more days after the date of signing, 
the parties will meet to discuss extra pay. So we're currently seeing this extra day of recurrent for 220 training, which just kind of gets lumped into our current uh, training pay. So going forward at date of signing, if the, when the contract ratifies, the company would not be able to add that additional day without first discussing with us. And then we can decide um, together through discussion, is that going to be an extra day of training or does it now fall, fall into our provisions where it's an additional um, non-CQT training day and that would follow uh, the, the less than nine hours and the pay that goes along with that. So those are the three big wins that we have here in our training article um, and happy to share that with you. All right, thank you, Sonia. As a housekeeping um, note, I do want to uh, bring attention to everyone. The first link that I shared in our town hall that is a PDF is a TA2 resource FAQ. That is a one-stop shop like clip notes page for those who have questions as to where they can find something or um, ask something, that sheet will provide you with accessibility and options of empowerment for you to gain more clarity and understanding as well as, as, well as access points to give or receive information. So I just wanna state that. Thank you, Sonia, for unpacking Article 15. We're gonna move on to Article 35, Missing Internment Prisoner or Hostage of War Relief. This article is gonna be unpacked by Ernesto, our Orlando-based negotiating team representative. Article 35 can be found on our, uh, page 163, and I'm going to hand it over to Ernesto. Good evening, Ernesto. Audio check one, two. Good to go. Thank you, Taisha. Uh, hey, everybody. Uh, Ernesto here. Thanks for joining. Uh, this So this article, um, much like, uh, I guess, uh, article of leaves of absence that we covered some, some Zoom calls uh, back, it's, uh, it's one of those, like I said, it's uh, about, like some of the sections in the article of leave of absence, it's just good to know. And though some of this stuff is pretty, <laughs> being a relatively short article is packed uh, with some pretty heavy um, but beneficial info to be familiar with. Um, and like I said, it's a little scary or unnerving, but I'm packing, we will, as we've been doing. So that's what we're here for. Let me get my uh, goggles on and uh, we get started. So. This, pretty, this article, article pretty much covers like eligi eligibility, uh, compensation, um, uh, term, uh, forms of internment, um, exclusions of such, and how seniority um, works with this. So we'll start from the top pretty much. Um, the eligibility is pretty much applies to uh, in-flight crew members who while on duty. Um, you know, obviously this is not something we hope, we hope not to experience, but are kidnapped, you know, held as a prisoner of war or hostage um, by way of aerial piracy, you know. Um, the rate pretty much of uh, compensation, so the, the internment for aerial piracy, um, and I hate to use the word remunerates or, or compensate, but in-flight crewmen will be paid um, 85, hour, 85 hours monthly at their pay rates um, until found alive, returned to base, uh, death has been established or sufficient presumption of. So it's separated into three separate, um, it's divided into three separate, con uh, separate conditions. So condition A is if the company, this is within the first 12 months, if the company doesn't know if the in-flight room is alive or deceased, uh, the 12 months start from the last known date that the in-flight crew member was imprisoned. So condition B, this will be after those 12 months, um, if the company still has no knowledge of the in-flight crew member, you know, whether they're alive or deceased, deceased after those 12 months, the, the 85 hours monthly will continue until death or presumption of. Condition C, the third and last conditions, if the in-flight crew member is later found to be alive, retroactive pay will ensue, calculated by the difference, the total amount of the total amount of compensation the company paid, including the death benefit. And the amount that should have been paid out, the amount that should have been paid out had death not been presumed. Once that calculation is, is finished and completed, then the 85 hours uh, pay starts back up again until the inflect room is no longer imprisoned. So, moving on to internment, um, other than aerial piracy, um, 
are considered like somewhat of a war zone, you know. So if an in-flight room is in-flight room is on duty uh, in a war zone, so this, like let's say you're on a layover, um, yeah, or you're sent to training, or you're doing a, you know, a flight to and from a, a city, you know, and the aircraft is held hostage on the ground. So if an in-flight room is on on duty in a war zone, held hostage or goes missing, uh, they're allowed the same compensation of 85 hours monthly for the 12 months or until death is established as we uh, previously mentioned. If in-flight crew members still missing after 12 months or death is established, the company will pay out your death benefit. Uh, disbursement, how that works is the company will pay out this compensation as specified on the beneficiary form provided to the in-flight crew mem members at uh, date of hire, you know, along with those other forms, many other forms that we fill out. Um, in-flight crew members will continue to accrue seniority while imprisoned or held hostage um, as a result of aerial piracy. And of course, we got to cover exclusions. What excludes us from such is, uh, is if an in-flight crew member's gross misconduct uh, causes them to go missing, detained or interned, uh, if they engage in activities that they knew or should have known were illegal. Um, if an in-flight crew member voluntarily entered an area that, were, that they were cautioned or warned to avoid by the company, US government, or the foreign local government, if an in-flight if an in crew member is being held by US government. Um, overall, that pretty much concludes it. Um, overall, this article in and of itself, as like I said, as unnerving as it is to read through, it is a win for us because previously we didn't have any language on a topic like this. You know, it's it's a it's a serious topic, no less, and it's, it's, it's good. I'm glad that we actually have this, you know, in our sensitive agreement potential contract. So thank you. If any of my team members wants to add anything, please. Oh, you good. All right. Thank you, Ernesto, for unpacking Article 35. Um, that, again, is found on page 163 of your TA2, and I provided you with your supplemental reading Canva link as well. Our next article is our savings clause, also kind of a short article. That um, article is going to be unpacked by D. This article starts on page 165, and uh, D represents our Fort Lauderdale base as a negotiating team member. Welcome, D. Thank you, Taisha, for hosting tonight and welcome everyone. Um, so I have a really easy article tonight. Article 36 is your savings clause. Should any part or provision of this agreement be rendered invalid by existing or subsequently enacted legislation, the balance of agreement shall remain in force and effect. So simply stating that if part of the contract becomes invalid due to new legislation, the rest of the contract remains in effect. That's it. And that's that on that powerful statement. <laughs> and thank you, Dee, for unpacking Article 36. Didn't require a lot of work, so that's amazing. Um, our last article we're unpacking is going to be done by Brendan. Uh, this is Article 26, Expenses, which is literally the exact opposite in length of what Dee just unpacked. We're going to start on page 126. Hope everyone has their beverage and their snack available. And Brendan represents our Los Angeles base as our negotiating team rep. Welcome, Brendan. Yep. Thanks, Taisha. Appreciate that. And uh, thanks to everybody for joining the call. Um, yeah, the expenses article um, had, covers a lot of important ground, obviously, uh, in the name itself gives gives away uh, some of the intent of the article and the purpose of the article, but we'll go through it um, and highlight some of the more important um, topics in, in the article. So first and foremost, what it says in the very first paragraph is that every in-flight crew member will be uh, entitled to a single occupancy hotel room. Um, so at no time will a, an in-flight crew member um, have to share a hotel room with another in-flight crew member or anybody else for that matter. So um, that is that is maybe overlooked because you may think, well, that's ridiculous. How, how, how could I ever be in, uh, expected to share a hotel room with somebody else? But unless it's in your contract that's legally binding, uh, that could happen. And so that 
may uh, be something that could over be overlooked, but an important reminder of why uh, having that in the contract is so important. Secondly, uh, one of the things that we fought hard over with the company that we're really happy about uh, achieving in this tentative agreement is the right uh, for an in-flight crew member who has an unexpected layover in base uh, to request and be provided a uh, request for and be provided a hotel room. Uh, you know, we know <clears throat> that currently and over the last uh, several years, in-flight crew members who have a modification to their uh, assignment or their trip uh, have been left in the lurch by the company, uh, paying out of pocket for their hotel room in base. Uh, and that was something that just was not fair. And one of the issues that we sought to fight to, um, to achieve in this tentative agreement, and we're proud that we've, we've been able to achieve that. So if you are a commuter, for example, who does not have a, um, a, a, you do not live in, in base, this is certainly something that is a huge win for you, but also those uh, in-flight crew members who may live quote unquote in base, uh, but have uh, very lengthy commutes or not able to get home uh, in, in an easy, easily achievable way, uh, that, may, that may also affect you. So one thing that I wanted to highlight in this expenses article is that uh, that we that we we were able to get that. Uh, next, I'd like to point out that we have now defined in the agreement what is considered a long layover, and that it will be any layover over 16 hours and 59 minutes. So, uh, 17 hours and higher will be considered a long layover, and any long layover needs to uh, have a hotel that is either downtown or if you're lucky enough, uh, an oceanfront or beachfront uh, property. Um, so that was also something that we felt strongly needed to be um, be codified in this agreement so that we would know that those lengthier um, layovers would be able to enjoy and be able to uh, explore uh, cities and locales uh, and enjoy maybe a uh, a you know mai tai somewhere on the beach if that's your thing but um we we really are happy that we were able to get that you know i think they've gone up and up and up over the years as to what the company determines to be a a, a long layover so we were happy that we and if we see after their contract is ratified that uh we're getting hotels that are not downtown that are uh, over over 17 hours in length, then that's another thing that we can grieve uh, and get and get uh, rectified. Um, another thing that I'll just mention quickly is that uh, on short layovers, we were able to get the fact that um, the length of limo of, of transportation time to and from the airport can no, be no greater than 30 minutes, which is also an important uh, an important thing. We you know you don't want to. You don't want to be on a short, short layover, minimum rest, and and be traveling forty five minutes to um, to get to your hotel uh, to get to get the rest that you need. Um, also, one of the important aspects of this uh, contract will be our uh, committee structure, and one of the committees that we've been able to get put in place in this tentative agreement is our hotel committee, and our hotel committee has been working hard. Even uh, for the last couple of years, we've had a memorandum of understanding uh, where that, that recognized our hotel committee and we appreciate all the work that our hotel committee does on our behalf. Uh, and we wanted to make sure going forward that we would have those same rights under our agreement. So we have established a, a, a legally recognized hotel uh, committee that will be able to work with us um, on, uh, work with us and the company on, on, on any layover issues that we may have, hotel issues that we have. Um, and uh, so that was that was also a good win. Going forward, a lot of, and, and you'll notice a pattern, a lot of this expenses article has to do with hotels. Um, it's just the way the, the article reads, but um, a, a, a pain point for a lot of in-flight crew members, uh, especially, Unfortunately, over the summertime and, and, and the difficulties that we've experienced uh, for some time now, but especially over the summertime, was the inability 
of the company to uh, have reliably sourced hotel rooms for us when we get to our layovers. And so one of the issues that we wanted to try to uh, uh, solve for in this agreement is what happens if, uh, un unfortunately, you don't have a hotel room waiting for you as you should when you get to your layover. And so we were able to codify in this agreement the ability of an in-flight crew member should she or he not have a, uh, a uh, hotel room when, when you arrive uh, to uh, expense a hotel room. So you can uh, book a, your own hotel room and get reimbursed for that. Also, uh, if you're waiting for a hotel room for extended periods of time, We've also got, gotten uh, achieved language in the agreement to protect uh, uh, in-flight crew members in that respect too. So if you're unfortunately having to wait two hours for a hotel room uh, before you can get to your rests, your duty period will be extended uh, so that <clears throat> you will not be considered at, at rest or on rest until you have been able to procure your hotel room or, or have arrived at the hotel. If unfortunately you're waiting even longer than that, up three hours or more for a hotel room, um, we were able to get codified the um, provisions that you will be paid for all of the legs that you've worked um, that day at a, at a higher rate, Point, uh, 1.4 times the uh, additional uh, on the premium pay scale or 0.35 on the straight pay scale. Um, the next section goes through ho hotel guidelines, and those are the standards that our hotels uh, will have to meet going forward. Uh, and, and our hotel committee will obviously be able to use those standards when sourcing hotel rooms and doing site visits. Uh, and that will be helpful uh, to, to them, but also to us. And, and, and you can go through those. That's obviously self-explanatory, self but um, an, important, uh, an important part of this expenses article. But one thing, and I think maybe most importantly in this article is our per diem rates are included in the expenses article. And this is um, one of the most significant uh, wins or one of, one of the significant wins when it comes to our compensation. And because as we all know, per diem can add up quickly because if you're away from base on a layover, that's untaxed. Uh, per diem. So you can earn a significant uh, amount of money per month based on your per diem. And obviously, as we know, it's every hour you're earning per diem, every hour you're on a trip, you're earning per diem. And so we currently get $2.15 an hour for domestic per diem. Through the life of this contract, that will go up 30 cents to $2.45 an hour. And, you know, you may, you may, uh, you know, look at me sideways and say 30 cents. Is that something to, to celebrate? And I will tell you, yes, yes, it is. Uh, 30 cents is a significant, significant increase uh, to both the domestic per diem rate as well as the international per diem rate, which will again go up from $2.35 currently to $2.65 over the life of the agreement. And, 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 and that significant increase will affect your monthly paycheck. And uh, that's just uh, something that may be easily overlooked. So, you know, we tend to look at the uh, compensation article and focus on the items in there, including our hourly rates that are, that are obviously hugely important, but I, I would not want anyone to overlook that significant win that we got for the uh, per diem rates. Uh, we were able to also codify the fact that our passport, as well as global entry um, uh, costs for, for, for those will be reimbursed by the company. So um, if you, if you uh, have global entry or you have to reapply for global entry going forward, that will, that will be reimbursed in all of our passport expenses as well. Um, the last thing I'll focus on on this one, because I know I'm running long, is the parking provisions that we've uh, succeeded in, in getting into this tentative agreement. And so what it says in this article is that um, every IFC will be provided free of charge parking in her or his base. 
So if you elect to have to park, if you have a car that you drive to work uh, in your base, you will be have parking free of charge as we do. If you report in a in a base that has a co base, the company will also be providing free of charge or via reimbursement parking at the co base as well. So you'll have parking at both your base as well as the co base if you if you uh, are parking at your co at a co base location. If you're in Boston or JFK, you will continue to have the availability of transit checks. If you do not uh, need the parking in base, you can choose to have uh, continue to, to receive your transit checks. But one thing that we don't currently have and that we um, knew was uh, an important uh, provision of this that we, that we wanted to get in here is that there are some in-flight crew members who don't um, need, need parking and also don't have uh, the need for a transit check or don't don't um, don't aren't um, in a base that has transit checks. And if you're in that situation, what we've been able to get in the agreement is a forty dollars stipend that will just be paid to you um, as part of uh, as part of your monthly um, uh, compensation. And so, if it, that is a that is a win for all of our in-flight crew members who who um, who may choose to 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 do that, it says if an IFC elects to waive parking or, if applicable, the transportation cards, they will receive forty dollars per month in a stipend. Uh, so that's something that uh, that we we were able to achieve in this agreement. And I appreciate your patience with me as I went through that, but I uh, wanted to cover uh, most of the, the article and certainly the highlights. And uh, thank you, Taisha. All right, thank you, Brendan. Um, super important article expenses. And again, $40 there, when we talk about little words, bigger picture and making sure that you find all the touch points as it relates to pay and pay increases. This is one of those um, articles where there is hidden pay increases that do affect our paychecks. So that concludes actually our article unpacking for this town hall number six. We are going to move on to items to clarify or correct. We're going to begin, I believe, with dues breakdown. That's going to be spoken by Stacy. This pertains to questions that arise as it relates to where are my dues going? Is the international taking all my dues? how is dues being divided and divvied out um, between the local and international. And I'm going to hand that to Stacy. Hi, everyone. Um, so before I start on the dues, um, you know, I lost my train of thought before and I will wind up doing one of these clarifications on my own article if I don't mention something very important on occupational seniority. And that is um, uh, paragraph D, letters E and F, uh, and that pertains to uh, someone in management, uh, supervisor role or support role coming back onto the line. Um, and if there is a furlough, they can't bump you. Um, if they want to come into a base or, um, you know, a, a qualification and there's not a room, you're not going to be bumped out to make room for them. So, uh, you know, anyone returning to the line can't bump an IFC out of a base and award or, or in a furlough. Um, and that's really, really important to note. And I did not want to leave that out. So thank you for bearing with me there. And on to dues. So the question is, uh, what do our dues pay for? Um, so as we all know, our dues will be uh, $35 a month for the life of the contract. Uh, it's worth noting that these are some of the lowest in the industry. Uh, they don't begin until we establish our local and they're not retroactive. Um, but what happens to that money? So first it gets divided in two. We have 70% that stays with our local and that is I believe the highest percentage of any of the flight tenant unions by the way. And 30% uh, goes to the TWU International. And uh, we'll give you a breakdown of some of the things that money helps pay for. So if we're looking at our local, obviously we have offices. We have to have rent. We have to have utilities. The lights need to be on. There needs to be paper and printer ink. And, um, and then, of course, there's the officers doing the work. They need to be paid. There needs to be loss of pay for um, the union reps, shop stewards, whatever uh, we decide to call them uh, for their grievance uh, meetings to attend those. 
uh, loss of pay for flight tenants handling uh, union business. So that's your various committees so they can do their work, attend meetings, et cetera. Um, you know, lawyers to assisting grievances, we need to uh, fund the negotiating for our next contract, all of that, all of those items. Um, and then when you get down to the international, again, you know, offices and utilities, um, travel, hotels to negotiations, other union business. Uh, we have strategic campaigns to help expose the issues around toxic cabin air. Um, we have attorney's fees to make sure that our tentative agreement language that you're looking at is legal. Um, we have health and safety committees that go to um, uh, FEDAP training to help IFCs um, and flight tenants everywhere, um, computer databases, monthly fees, trainings. Um, we, we have staff that lobby at Congress for things like um, protective equipment, um, you know, the, the, the PSP money that forced the airlines to keep us employed, um, you know, the the air quality regulations, which is our fume events, required rest, you know, all of this is stuff that we lobby for, for these laws to be passed for us. And that's, um, that's separate from political endorsements. This is lobbying on our behalf to protect us. Uh, political endorsements cannot legally be paid for with dues. Uh, that comes from uh, voluntary COPE contributions. Um, and then of course we have just assisting with the locals um, we maintain, a, you know, there's a bottom line that the, that the international has to run, uh, run that they've never uh, had a problem with the Department of Labor. Um, salaries just for people who keep everything running and moving. Um, our TAs being printed cost money and um, helping flight attendants and other um, work groups, you know, organize and negotiate and the way that we did for three years uh, just negotiating this contract without uh, having to pay a single penny um, and all of the organizing done before that. That's that's where that 30% goes. So, um, you know, I, I'm proud to pay it. Um, I think it's priceless uh, to have that kind of protection that, uh, you know, I don't think of it as buying uh, a raise or buying um, this thing or another. I think of it as insurance for for my livelihood and my peace of mind, so. All right, thank you, Stacy. Um, that concludes basically our clarification as it relates to dues. Um, Travis has opened up the chat or will be opening up the chat for any questions um, that are especially pertaining to the five articles, five articles that we unpack um, during this town hall. If there are article, uh, any questions that I read to the NT and they feel that more research and attention is needed to that specific question, that question will be rolled over into our next town hall and we do have two more left. Um, and those will be answered in those next um, two, within the next two town halls. There was an anonymous question that was asked um, stating uh, uh, this anonymous question is, which article states or where in the contract does it state that dues will be $35 a month for the life of the contract? That question um, was answered via an international level uh, letter that was sent that can be reposted and um, published again, as well as uh, anything pertaining to local structures as a housekeeping note, anything pertaining to local structuring and building, you will actually find that in our local bylaws when the local bylaws are created. Um, but that is what the agreement between the company and the TWU is our TA2 contract. Anything relating between agreement between us and international will be um, found in local structure bylaws, but I will be able to get that specific graphic. If I can get it before this um, end of this town hall, I'll be able to publish it. If not, it'll be published as a clarification in social media groups and sent to that individual who asked that anonymous question. Um, the next art, uh, the next actual clarification we actually have two tonight is about Zervi days that's going to be handled back uh, to our Boston OBL negotiating team representative I'm going to give that to Sonia to clarify Zervi days thank you sure yeah thanks Taisha so yeah there's been a lot of confusion as to a particular section in the qualified roles article about the reserve day blocks so um, again it's article 29 letter I Number two, and it's uh, 
letters, basically uh, letter C. So currently in the qualified role domestic product, this is a domestic question, not transatlantic. I should have clarified that. We currently bid for reserve blocks that are three, four, or five days in length. And that has been for quite some time now. Three, four, or five days, you bid on them by preference, they're awarded to you by seniority. They have added an additional block. So now there will be three, four, five, and six day blocks available for reserve bidding. This is not a mandatory thing. This is not a mandatory day added onto your reserve blocks. This just is an additional reserve block that the company may or may not utilize as the beginning of letter C, little, little letter C does say reserve blocks will be determined by operational need. Domestic with a minimum of three days and a maximum of six days. We may never see a six day block. We may see six day blocks all the time. It just depends if they feel as though they want to start adding six day blocks, those will be available to bid. If that does not suit you, then that's your priority, your prerogative, excuse me, to bid for a, a shorter uh, reserve block. However, again, they are awarded in seniority order based on the days that you've uh, bid for. So again, just to clarify that, that is not an extra day that you will be required to sit reserve. It is just an additional block that you are, are available to bid. So thanks for that time, Taisha, to clear that up. All right, thank you, Sonia, for that clarification on Zervi days as it relates to qualified roles. Um, we're actually gonna move to pulled, pulled submitted from questions from the website. We have um, two of those today. Our first one is gonna go to Ernesto, our resident LOD, also representative. Any changes to the LOD program, specifically the opt-out portion? I'm giving that to Ernesto, thank you. Right, thank you, Taisha. Um, I'm not sure who, who asked the question, but oh, it was anonymous, right? You said? Yeah, okay. Well, to whoever asked. Anonymous. To whoever asked. Sorry, hold on a second. Make sure. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah. Okay, so um, to whoever asked, good question. Um, the opt out uh, was we were able to change that back to two years, which is what it was originally. Um, I can't remember when, maybe my team members can help me recall. I don't know if it was like 2008 or 2009 where the company changed it to five years uh, commitment. I can't quite remember, but nonetheless, we were able to bring it back to how it originally was. At least when I first uh, was hired um, as a Spanish qualified speaker. Um, I know you said it, the question was, um, were there any changes to the LOD, specifically the opt-out program? I don't know if I should uh, touch up on the other uh, wins we got, or should we leave that for the LOD article? Or you can start a little bit of that here, and then I'll okay. do a housekeeping note after. Okay, so briefly, um, so again, uh, first, uh, first, um, win for us is that we were able to uh, change that commitment back down to two years. Uh, the other is uh, we were able to keep the uh, the two LOD trips monthly that you have. so you have to bid for two monthly LOD pairings, and you're on your monthly bid. Um, and without the comp without leadership being able to change that on a whim, you know, which they previously could, they could no longer do that. So it has to stay at two. And of course you could either be awarded two more or sometimes none, you know? Um, and then the last, uh, which is a, a, a great one, uh, for us was that now you can drop down to zero LOD pairings for the month. So long as you trade them off to another qualified, um, LOD in flight crew member. So whereas before we could, I can't tell you how many times I've tried to drop something that was LOD and I, and I had other LODs that were perfectly willing, happy and able to take it, but you know, it would put me under my, my two minimum. So that is a great one for us. Again, utilizing the trade board, uh, you know, or swapping it with another qualified LOD crew member, you can drop your, your two monthly required down to zero. So. And of course, we end up on some future, one of the next two town halls, I think we're gonna well unpack the LOD article and we'll go over that again, so. All right, that was Ernesto um, answering the LOD question. As a housekeeping note, LOD again is gonna be unpacked in another town hall. That town hall actually will include bilingual language spoken in order to um, capture our audiences of which English is not their first language. So Ernesto will be giving part of that LOD unpacking in Espanol. And I will be assisting with that too as a fellow Latina person. And 
and we definitely will make that announcement available to those as soon as we can so that everyone who um, needs a little extra help as it relates to understanding the contract as someone who does not have English as a uh, first language can be able to gain assistance and clarification in another avenue that is empowering to them. All right, so our next um, question poll is from Susie. I have been here for 22 years. Um, they have a question about whether or not PTO has changed and what the new contract means regarding PTO, um, as well as minimum hours and bid. I'm going to give that entire question to Stacy. Um, Stacy again represents New York. And thank you, Stacy. Hey, Susie. Um, so um, the question of the change to our PTO is um, basically, I, I see it as a little bit of an investment in terms of we're investing a little bit of flexibility to get a gain overall. So the, in one year, January 2023, um, then we will see that we will have 108 hours of our discretionary PTO, but your overall accrual uh, with your VPTO which is going to be 70 hours, is going to give you a total of 178 hours, total accrual of PTO and VPTO combined. And that is a 34 hour annual increase overall over what uh, we currently have. And then if you move down to January, 2024, which is you know two short years away, and we all know that goes by in a snap, uh, at that point, you'll be at 142 hours for your overall PTO accrual annually, which is negligible difference from what we have today, um, a two hour difference, plus the 70 hours of the VPTO. So that is an overall increase of 68 hours for a total of 212 hours combined PTO VPTO. Um, now, what that looks like in terms of uh, financials, obviously it's two weeks off more than what we're getting now for um, a negligible difference in flexibility at the two year mark. Um, now, and that's why we kind of call it two free weeks. Um, so let's assume you're on the straight scale because you also asked about what's the minimum you can fly. So I'm gonna assume you're on the straight scale. And that means starting in 2024, that's uh, if you multiply your, your pay rate times your additional uh, 68 hours, or sorry, your additional, um, excuse me for a second. So lost my whole train of thought. Anyway. Yep. If you um, would multiply so, by 68, you're right, Stacey. Anyway, yeah. if, you look at, if you look at 2024 and you multiply your pay rate on the straight scale, um, that hourly value is going to go up with your annual raise, but for that year, it will be um, $3,990. Um, and then if you jump ahead to the top of the pay scale for us, uh, if you look at 2026, again, you look at your additional uh, 63, uh, 68 hours, and that number is going to be $4,233 additional every single year. Um, and that will be the number, again, $4,233 extra every single year until we negotiate a new contract and uh, there's a raise and that number goes up. Um, and of course we can split vacation, which is new for us. Uh, so you can divide it after the bid into uh, a three day period here and four days there within your month on days that you already have off. Uh, you can slide your vacation as we do now. You can PTX as we do now. Uh, we will now be able to pick up over our vacation time and be paid in addition. So that is um, from open time, trade board, premium, uh, global, whatever is available. Uh, you will be able to pick up those pairings and be paid on top of your vacation pay. And vacation pay will never be taken to cover uh, sick, FMLA, dis disability, unless you request it because you want to supplement your income. So um I know I am really looking forward to that, you know, giant chunk of money. And um, I, you know, I hope we all see that as the investment that it is a little bit of flexibility up front to gain overall. So that'll be the difference for you there. And uh, with regard to the 
uh, the bidding. So you asked about what's the lowest you'll be able to fly. Um, obviously, we'll still have our minimum credit window. You'll be able to um, run that the way you currently do. You can bid for minimum. You can, um, you know, PTO down to nothing if you have the PTO available. Um, and of course, you will now have full PTO accrual, even if you are flying what's considered part time. Um, and we will have the new reduced credit window and those uh, that is a bid line, same as minimum target or maximum. And your reduced credit window is a, uh, a bid window of 35 to 45. So you will never be awarded less than 35 and you will never be awarded more than 45 if you hold that. And then again, you'll be able to PTO as, as much of that as you like because you will have that PTO available to you. All right, um, I do have an extra follow-up question as it relates to PTO. Stacy. what happens to the hours currently um, in their bank? So- Oh, those, those roll over. Uh, your PTO that is currently existing um, will be honored. Uh, first of all, your any award you have for next year is honored. Uh, it would be completely unfair to take that away from you. You, you were awarded it, you planned on it. So the awarded vacations are going to exist as they do. Uh, if you were awarded a, an incentivized vacation, that will be honored. Any existing PTO will roll over into your PTO bank as it does currently. And our new bank maximum is 510 hours. So you will have plenty of room for that PTO to roll over. And then the other follow-up question was, when does BPTO trigger to where it goes from one week to two weeks? Um, good thing I had that page open. So it, it really, it depends on um, kind of, of where you are on the seniority list. If you're only accruing 35 hours, you're not required to bid for 70 hours. So um, the required for the bid, the, the two, if you have the two weeks, that's gonna be, oof, goodness. If somebody's faster on the draw than I am. Uh, yeah, if, if I'm understanding the question correctly, it's what seniority you gain the second week. And I think I think that's the question. Uh, is that but 10? they'll have to bid for it. Oh, well, 10 years, um, at 10 years, you'll get that second, um, that second, that second week. I thought that that was the question. Yep. Ooh, that was the question. Oh, okay. Well, that's easy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I misunderstood it. <laughs> All right. Um, so we're going to continue with pools from previous town hall. Thank you, Stacy. This is, I'm um, hoping to get all of the questions. Um, they are asking about what happens when uh, this person had their healthy rewards taken away. Um, they want to know as a full-time employee with health insurance outside of JetBlue, why were their healthy rewards taken away? And I'm going to hand that off to Dee. Dee is going to answer that question for us. So um, I believe this question is from David. Thank you, David, for the question. It's an interesting question. And the first thing I'll say, it's just an example of why a contract is important. With all things that are secured in a contract, the company cannot discontinue or change them. So that said, the company made the change to take healthy rewards away from all employees that were not participating in our health insurance plan. And since our health benefits are the same or similar, to those plans made available to all the employees except the pilots, we also had our healthy rewards taken away. So should the company reinstate these healthy rewards, we would be eligible to get them as well. That's the story. All right, thank you. Um, and just as a a uh, quick housekeeping note, reduce credit flying as it relates to um, all of that is our article, I'm going to say 10, page 47, for those who are asking more questions about reduced credit flying. Um, that concludes, and I'm going to give everyone back about four minutes since we started at uh, 7.05. Stacy has a clarifying comment and question. Yes. Yes, I did find the thing I was looking for. So it is under... Um vacation, the, the PTO, VPTO, it's B 
four a and that's where it says effective uh september 22 so that's next september round of bidding uh each ifc will have to bid the one week uh, unless you don't have the one week because you're new and then 2023 each ifc will have to bid the two weeks unless they are junior and don't have the two weeks all right that's what i was looking for thank you and that has been memorialized. Thank you. We did have one other submitted anonymous uh, question. That is also going to require um, some additional research and information pulling. So I will be sending that to the NT after this town hall. Um, and uh, that is directly to that anonymous person who sent me that question or series of questions. Um, at this time, I'm going to end this town hall. It is 8.03. Um, PM. I'm also going to take a picture of this question just in case I don't get it in time that I need to send it as soon as possible so it can get answered. So I'm going to do that. And I want to thank everyone who showed up to this town hall and we hope to see you again, I believe December 2nd for town hall number seven. Have a great evening, everyone.